Langley's Hulk is smarter than you think. It's a surprisingly sophisticated deep dive into the psyche of Bruce Banner and the Hulk. It released in 2003 and was maligned at the time. Yeah. But it's since developed a cult following. I like it. Let's dive in and explore why. Backstory time. Dark Bruce Banner, belted by Gamma Race, turned into the Hulk. Ain't he unglamorous? In this case, the story's a little more complicated. David Banner was a scientist on a desert military base. His aim was to give people super immune systems using DNA from various animals. When he was barred from human testing, he experimented on himself. This genetic alteration was then passed down to his son, Bruce. The results were, apparently, so horrific that David tirelessly searched for a cure. When the military discovered David experimented with human blood, he was kicked off the project. In his anger, David set the base to self-destruct. I'm not sure why he did this, or how he had the access to do so, but whatever. He then rushed home and, believing his chance to cure Bruce gone, attempted to kill him. His wife intervened, taking the knife meant for Bruce, and David was put away for 30 years. To cope with his trauma, Bruce repressed the memories and emotions of this experience, which in turn became its own persona, the Hulk. I'll go into more detail on this a little later. Bruce grew up to become a scientist, working on nanomed reconstruction with his ex-girlfriend Betty. They split because of how emotionally distant he is, something Betty is both attracted to and annoyed by. Just a byproduct of my inexplicable obsession with emotionally distant men. Clunky exposition aside, there is evident chemistry between the two. I hate them. Wait, I just got here. Who do we hate? What have you had, Betty? Like one beer? I'm just saying. I'm just saying. So it's not unbelievable they dated in the first place. I think he appreciates her sassiness. Look, nobody expects this to be easy. Us working together after being so close. We were close? Look, if I could be more... She's also compassionate. She wants to help Bruce sort through his psychological issues, even after they've separated, and will go to great lengths to do so. She's steadfast in her beliefs. She stands up to Talbot's attempts to take control of the lab. She argues with her father for Bruce's well-being, and she's determined to help Bruce despite the dangers of the Hulk. This makes her an invaluable supporter of Bruce throughout the movie, someone he can trust as the world turns on him. Bruce and Betty run an important experiment. They have an injured frog breathe in these microscopic machines called nanomeds. They hit him with gamma radiation. His injuries close up, and all seems well until... I will come with the frog- ah! While the nanomeds are meant to accelerate cellular repair, it's not clear what role the gamma is playing. There's a deleted scene that explains this. The nanomeds, which are essentially little molecular machines, remain inert in the body until we activate them with a burst of gamma radiation. Afterwards, Bruce gets home and continues working. He drifts off and starts to dream. Throughout the movie, Bruce has dreams that contain images with symbolic meaning that demonstrate his psychology. Some of this symbolism is used broadly to express ideas that aren't specifically derived from Bruce's experiences. The colors green and purple represent Hulk, for obvious reasons. The movie focuses a lot on eyes to express the concept of something lying deep within a person's psyche. It's often used to communicate the base aggression all people possess beneath the consciousness they present to others. The id behind the ego. I think the Hulk is a representation of our inner aggression, this survival instinct that's animal-like, but it's so ugly and monstrous and non-logical. We have to cover up with our consciousness, with our logic and ways and means of dealing with uh, each other. In Bruce's case, the Hulk is his base aggression that dwells within. Some of the movie's symbols are derived from Bruce's childhood experiences. The infamous door, the one his father dragged his mother behind, and the one his father burst out of with intent to kill. It represents David and the source of Bruce's trauma. Then there's the explosion from the gamma bomb. It went off as his mother died and is thus associated with the birth of the Hulk, as he was a persona born of the trauma of seeing her death. The garden of Bruce's old home is one of the most important symbols. At the start, there's a scene where baby Bruce watches his mother in the garden. She's a happy and calming presence. The camera then focuses on the plants around her, creating an association with this plant life and Bruce's mother. Bruce decorates his home with these plants to subconsciously surround himself with reminders of her calming influence, which helps him keep his emotions buried. Even Hulk, when he's unleashed, finds them calming. And I think Betty provides a similar influence on Bruce and plays a similar symbolic role in the movie. Her appearance is uncannily similar to his mother, which may subconsciously attract Bruce to her. It's no coincidence she's also a calming and compassionate influence on Bruce. So he's spritzing his plants when he starts to dream. The plants remind him of the desert he used to live in. This reminds him of that day. The image morphs into green and purple particles. The Hulk, aka his trauma, 
Then a vague memory of his father, the source of that trauma, coming to take his mother away. The camera zooms into David's eye to reveal Hulk, and he wakes up. This dream hints at something very important for the movie's Hulk-Bruce dynamic. Long before the Gamma accident, the Hulk existed in Bruce as a persona born of the trauma of witnessing his father kill his mother. It's why purple and green are being associated with that day. Since he was a child, Bruce was inclined to bottle up his emotions, so his memories and strong feelings associated with that event were repressed and became its own separate personality, one that would remain dormant for 30 years. It's about repression and, uh, and release of repression. You have to close yourself up, you have to deny your really urge and need. Mm -hmm. And in the meantime, you have that primal impulse, the life forces, uh, the Hulk in you, the, the alter ego that keep us alive, energetic, and that has a lot of aggression in it. Hence, zooming into Bruce's eye to show Hulk buried beneath. Later that night, David, having become the lab janitor, takes one of Bruce's hairs he stole from his office and experiments on it. You know, for a dude who just got out of a 30-year prison sentence and has been working as a janitor for a month, he sure has a lot of high-tech equipment. How do he get his hands on all this shit? Anyway, the next day, Bruce heads into the office and is surprised to find Talbot. He's a military man working for a company called Atheon. He wants to relocate their lamp to a desert base, where they'll work for him, using their tech exclusively for the military. Bruce tells him to get fucked. He wants to help people, not just soldiers. That's why he's developing the nanomed technology. We're doing the basic science for everyone. Talbot departs, but not without leaving a threat behind. There's a hair's breadth between friendly offer and hostile takeover. Bruce enters a sectioned off part of the lab to help his coworker Harbor with the gamma sphere. It malfunctions, and automatically starts the experiment with them inside, and without any way to stop it. Bruce gets a mask on Harper before the nanomids are dispersed into the air, then he shields him from the gamma exposure. True to his character, Bruce is caught in the crossfire helping someone. Bruce is engulfed in a hazy green effect. The camera zooms into his eye to reveal Hulk. Then it zooms into Hulk's eye to reveal the gamma bomb, which represents the birth of the Hulk, followed by what sounds like a deep heartbeat. This represents a second birth for the Hulk. Bruce's trauma gave birth to the Hulk's mind, while this accident is what gives birth to Hulk's body, hence the heartbeat, Hulk's heartbeat. Sometime later, Bruce wakes up in a hospital room, as fine as can be. Betty is understandably distraught. She thought Bruce was going to die, and no one can explain why he didn't. Hey, I'm not gonna explode, okay? Yeah. Are you sure about that? That night, he has a nightmare. Green cells bubble over into some lizards, then jellyfish in the desert. These were the animals David studied to create the enhancer he tested on himself and passed on to Bruce, and this was done on a desert base. This represents the genetic alteration interacting with the nanomeds and the gamma introduced into Bruce's system. There are several quick cuts to his mother's garden, as if his mind is desperately trying to calm himself to suppress Hulk. Cut to the frog exploding in the failed experiment. Hey, I'm not gonna explode. He is going to explode. Just not in the way anyone expected. The image morphs into green and purple cells. It hones in on the infamous door, opens, and reveals Hulk in shadow. This dream tells us that the mental barriers Bruce put in place to suppress those memories and emotions are no longer sufficient. It's only a matter of time before they burst out of him. In the middle of the night, Bruce is visited by David and his dogs. Daddy? <laughs> Daddy, is that you? He's here to drop some serious revelations. Of course, you're my flesh and blood. My physical son, but the child of my mind, too. You're lying. My parents died when I was a small boy. Everything your extraordinary mind has been seeking all these years, it's been inside you. It's Miss Ross again. There's something you need to know about her, Bruce. Something troublesome. It's too much for Bruce, so he tells David to get fucked. We're gonna have to watch that temper of yours. On another night, Bruce analyzes his blood. A paranoia washes over him as he considers what David told him. Could there have been something hidden in his blood this whole time? This triggers all of his anxieties, stresses, and pent-up frustrations to come crashing down on him all at once. The secrets hidden in his blood, the reappearance of his supposedly deceased father, the failure of the nanomeds, the death of his mother, Talbot's hostile takeover, and the gamma accident. Among these memories, we see the door. It cracks, something inside forcing its way out. We get a flash of Betty, smiling. A happy memory. His subconscious trying to keep his emotions at bay. But it fails, and Hulk is freed. I think paranoia 
elements creep in and gradually driving him insane is just as much uh, important, if not more so, than somebody poking his shoulder, push him around and make him angry. Fear and anger, anxiety, they're very close feelings. I hope all those uh, elements gradually creeping in and drive him insane and Hulk out. Bruce transforms and Hulk goes on a violent rampage. He barrels through the lab, but not randomly. He first goes for the office, where his anxiety spiked and caused him to Hulk out. Then he destroys the gambosphere involved in the accident. Hulk destroys the perceived cause of his problems. Like how you have a shitty day, and you stub your toe on a table leg. Then you get irrationally angry at the table, as if it's what caused your shitty day. What have you done? Once the targets of his rage are smashed, he enters the hallway, and comes face to face with David. Hulk recalls a happy moment from his childhood, but this triggers a traumatic memory to resurface. Hulk freaks and leaps. The next morning, Betty finds Bruce passed out in his house. He tells her about David, before her father, General Ross, shows up. He's here to investigate Bruce's involvement in the lab's destruction. Betty does some snooping and finds out where David lives. She visits him, and he confirms that he's Bruce's father. Now, if you excuse me, Miss Ross, I have some work to do. And don't worry about the dogs. You'll be fine. Just don't look him in the eyes. Sometimes foreshadowing is relatively obvious. Meanwhile, Ross interrogates Bruce. Turns out it was Ross that put David away. He gets released, and a month later your lab is destroyed. What a coincidence. You know, I hadn't thought of that. David tracks down Bruce after 30 years, and shortly after, the Gamma accident occurs. That's a pretty convenient timeline. Although the movie is no stranger to such outlandish coincidences. I mean, what are the odds Bruce and Betty just so happen to be raised on the same desert base, and that their fathers knew each other, and then they happen to meet as scientists in the same exact field 30 years later? Do you believe in destiny? Uh, no. When Ross realizes Bruce isn't working with David, he puts him on house arrest while they continue their investigation. That night, Bruce gets a call from David. By using Bruce's DNA, and by recreating the accident, he turned his dogs into Hulk dogs. He sent them after Betty, and Bruce will have to transform to save her. Talbot then shows up and tries to knock Bruce's block off. This makes Bruce Hulk out. He launches Talbot through a wall, kicks him into a railing, then chucks him at another dude. With how much Hulk deliberately roughs up Talbot, I wonder why he chose to spare David. Perhaps due to his mixed feelings on the man? Anyway, it's actually quite laughable this doesn't kill Talbot. The movie goes out of its way to show that Hulk doesn't aim to kill people. This results in some pretty unlikely scenarios, where soldiers survive crashing helicopters, flying tanks, and in Talbot's case, being kicked to shit. Hulk, somehow knowing exactly where she is, meets Betty at the lake house. They share a tender moment, where Betty recognizes him as Bruce, before the Hulk dogs arrive. Hulk punches some doggy dick and wins. <laughs> when Hulk defeats them, they burst into green particles. For some reason. Maybe that's what David meant by them being unstable? After the battle, Hulk reverts back into Bruce. He staggers over to Betty and gets kinky with it. Harder, Daddy! She brings him inside, and Bruce explains that David sent the dogs. He wanted me to change. She wanted me to change into that mindless Hulk. In other iterations of the character, Hulk is typically named by someone else. We've got to find that... that... Hulk. And thus a name is given to the green-skinned Goliath. But in this rendition, Bruce is the one to come up with the name. Hulk is a part of Bruce. The Gamma just unleashed what was already there. Unleashed what? Me. Hence, Bruce names himself. All that Hulk is comes from Bruce, right down to his name. The next morning, Betty calls Ross, and Bruce is taken into custody by the military. They relocate him to an underground facility beneath the abandoned desert base of his childhood. Meanwhile, SWAT raid David's home as he works in the destroyed lamp to recreate the accident on himself. Like Bruce, he's covered in a hazy green effect. The camera zooms into his eye, and we see a blurry, muted version of the gamma bomb. This may indicate that David received less gamma, and therefore less power. It may also indicate that the source of David's trauma is the same as Bruce's. More on this later. David gains absorbing powers. He can turn his body into different materials, and merge himself into objects. I am not sure why his abilities are so radically different from Bruce's. Perhaps it has something to do with his genetic alteration. When he passed it on to Bruce, it may have mutated in such a way that it interacts with the nanomeds differently. General Ross is suspicious of Bruce because of the uncanny similarities between him and his father. He is his father's son. Every last molecule of him. He says he doesn't know his father, but he's working in the same exact goddamn field his father did. So either he's lying or it's something worse. 
There are a lot of parallels between Bruce and David. Both became scientists in the same field. Both experimented on themselves. Both destroyed their labs. Both unintentionally hurt the women they love. And both were imprisoned by Ross. This begs the question, is Bruce destined to become his father? Is it in his nature to do so? I think it's more likely that Bruce is subconsciously emulating his childhood experiences as a means of coping with his trauma. Bruce surrounds himself with desert plants to emulate his mother's garden. Bruce witnessed David lash out in anger and accidentally hurt the woman he loves. Bruce does the same. This is why, in his dreams, Hulk appears behind the infamous door, the same one his father burst out of. In Bruce's mind, there's an association between Hulk and his father, leading him to reenact some of David's actions when his rage takes control. These are subconsciously learned behaviors, designed to emulate what Bruce witnessed in his childhood to help him make sense of his experiences. It's not in Bruce's nature to become like David. This becomes evident when looking at the core of their characters. David is selfish, willing to hurt others in pursuit of power. Bruce is selfless, willing to strip himself of power to save lives. I will isolate it and treat it myself. I'll remove it and I'll kill it before it does any real harm. Some of these parallels can only be coincidence. Unlike David, Bruce never intended to experiment on himself. It was an accident. And it stretches believability to think Bruce entered the exact same field of science as his father when he was too young to know what David did for work. The movie has contrived these circumstances for the sake of theme and plot. Betty is also greatly influenced by her childhood experiences. We're told she and her father are distant. When they first meet up in the movie, they're awkward, unsure how to act around one another due to a lack of familiarity. This estranged relationship goes all the way back to Betty's childhood. The movie emphasizes one particular memory. She was no older than two, having ice cream with her father, when an emergency arose. He left her alone without so much as a word, and she was distraught. Betty sees that Bruce is emotionally distant and instinctively wants to help him. Just as she reminds Bruce of his mother, he reminds her of her father. She subconsciously seeks to reenact her relationship with her father. Just as she wants to bridge the gap between her and Ross, she wants to bridge the gap between her and Bruce. Some real Sigmund Freudian shit. Like Bruce, Betty emulates her childhood trauma as a way to cope. The movie demonstrates the effects of adolescent experiences on a person's psyche, and how that can follow him the rest of his life. Betty convinces Ross to let her try helping Bruce. She walks with him through the abandoned desert base. When they arrive at his old house, she encourages him to remember what happened on that day. Bruce is reluctant to try. The closer he gets to remembering, the more hesitant he becomes. In the end, the attempt fails, and they return to base. Shortly after, Talpa gains authority over Bruce through Atheon, wresting control away from Ross and Betty. Speaking of General Ross, the man holds a grudge against Bruce for the crimes of his father. He assumes Bruce must be following the same villainous path as David. Your friend in there, there's a good chance he's caught up in some very bad business. Unfinished business. So he comes down on him with great prejudice. It's only after learning Bruce doesn't even remember David, and after Talbot seizes authority over him, that Ross reflects on his misplaced indignation. He develops some compassion for Bruce after realizing he's a victim in all this, and he regrets not helping him as a kid when he had the chance. I had David Banner locked up and sent that kid away. I didn't give that boy a second thought. He was just collateral damage. He isn't anymore, is he? Moving forward, he tries harder to help Bruce, and is open to Betty's advice on the matter. Ross learns to treat Bruce as his own person, rather than as an extension of his father's sins. Having lost access to Bruce, Betty can do nothing more, so she leaves for Berkeley. Now that Talbot's in charge, he's dead set on replicating the Hulk's power. Talbot is kind of a shit character, you know? You know, you know, you know, you know, you know. His defining character trait is that he wants money. We've got to have money. He wants it so bad it makes him cartoonishly stupid. When the lab was destroyed and General Ross declared at a military site, Talbot somehow concluded that Bruce conspired with Ross against him. So he barged into his house and started kicking the cramp out of him. I'm not sure what this was meant to accomplish, aside from some assault charges. And for some reason, the guards outside just let it happen. Then after nearly dying, he gets Bruce in his custody. He needs a Hulk sample, so what does he do? He waltzes into his small ass cell and starts tasing him. Dude can barely walk and he wants to be stuck in a confined space with the Hulk. <laughs> Bad signs, maybe. But personally, grab. This doesn't work, because suddenly Bruce can prevent himself from transforming, at least when subjected to external pressures. I'm not sure when that happened, but whatever. So Talbot puts him in a tube and forcibly induces a nightmare. When he finally gets Bruce to Hulk out, he fails to get a sample, and Hulk breaks loose. His men temporarily trap Hulk in a hallway. And again, Talbot is dead set on getting a sample himself. It's like he has a death wish. As if it weren't enough that he's lethally stupid. His incompetence is crucial to the story. He's used as a plot device to facilitate two of the four Hulkouts. 
The one at Boos' house is especially contrived, given it is not clear what Talbot is even trying to accomplish. The movie is markedly worse for his involvement. And that's not to mention the absurd way he dies. When he finally realizes he's not getting a sample out of Hulk, he tries to kill him and accidentally blows himself up. Okay, let's talk editing real quick. Director Ang Lee wanted to give the movie a comic book feel and tried to emulate comic panels. This poses a dilemma when trying to translate this to a motion picture. In a comic, each panel represents a moment in a chronological series of events. This happens, then this happens, then this happens. While the movie does sometimes replicate this linear progression, for the most part it doesn't. The comic is a still picture, you have a composition and a linear movement in itself, so that you don't quite capture in a motion picture. What this style of editing does accomplish is a sense of scale in certain scenes. Take this one for instance. The panel-like editing helps portray the sheer size of the assembled police, SWAT, and military. This in turn emphasizes the power of the Hulk, which has made such a force necessary to confront him. It also lets the movie convey a greater amount of information without having to make a lot of quick cuts. It can be shown simultaneously. So we, we do take uh, some of the multi-images influences from the comic. Not so much a split screen, but see if we can get more out of what we're looking at than the regular linear structure. But at the same time, the constant barrage of weird transitions and strange framing can be distracting. Aang didn't want people to see where we were enacting our effect. The more seamless and the more confusing we could make it, the better. Sort of keep the eye guessing. Yeah, I don't know if that was a good idea. People can be pulled out of the story due to these strange edits. Such as... <laughs> no! <laughs> no! Oh, man. <laughs> <laughs> Wait, what? So weird. What? They just PNG'd him? <laughs> oh my gosh, that shot. That what? That's terrific. <laughs> what? <laughs> I know. Isn't that bizarre? Yo, know, that was the weirdest freeze frame I've ever seen. <laughs> <laughs> what the fuck? Uh, that was a choice. I <laughs> If you're enjoying the video so far, consider leaving a like. You can support me with super thanks and Patreon. Back to the video. Hulk escapes onto the surface and makes his way home, aka Betty. How he knows which direction to go is beyond me, but I digress. He's hounded by missiles, tanks, and helicopters along the way. He destroys a bunch, purposefully and miraculously, avoiding killing any of the soldiers in the process. Quick aside, some people get hung up on the movie CG. It's often described as dated or unfinished or shit. While, yeah. I personally don't mind it. It rarely pulls me out of the movie. My only major issue is that Hulk sometimes feels weightless. I imagine it was difficult at the time to portray something that was both massive and nimble. I don't know how much this is gonna cost. A lot. Fun fact, Ang Lee did the mocap for Hulk. <laughs> Look at him go. Hulk travels across sand dunes and giant rock formations. Wait, that looks like a dick until reaching the Golden Gate Bridge in San Fran. He's dogged by jet fire when one nearly hits a civilian helicopter. It swerves away and is about to crash into the bridge when Hulk leaps onto it, changing its course and saving the pilot and the civilians on the bridge. Until now, Hulk has avoided killing people. He often smashes and roars to intimidate rather than harm. But this is the first time he saves someone other than Betty, someone he has a personal attachment to. He has no attachment to this rando. Since Hulk is an aspect of Bruce, they share the same core trait the desire to help people, even at a cost to himself. The jet takes Hulk high into the sky. He loses consciousness and starts to dream. Bruce is shaving. He wipes at the fogged mirror and reveals Hulk, who bursts through the glass and grabs him. I'd like to point out something interesting. The Hulk in Bruce's dreams is distinctly different from the Hulk in reality. One is sinister and actively malicious, while the other helps people and actively avoids killing. Hulk, in Bruce's mind, represents a couple different ideas that may be separate from what he is in reality. In some ways, Hulk represents Bruce's father. He is that malicious force that scarred him in his youth. Puny human. It's every boy's worst nightmare. Your dad's a puny human. That's why Hulk appears inside the door his father burst out of, and why he's antagonistic towards Bruce. Hulk stuck his neck out to save people, and it was used against him, for someone like David, who lives his life selfishly and for power. This would be a mistake. Therefore, Dream Hulk insults Bruce. At the same time, Hulk represents Bruce's base aggression. 
In childhood, Bruce acted out that aggression by playing with his toys, as bottled up as he was. It was the only way he could express it. We often see this memory in Bruce's various dreams. In the context of this dream, Hulk represents both. That's why he is both antagonistic towards Bruce while also appearing as his reflection. He is simultaneously what Bruce fears, what Bruce is, and what Bruce might become. That's one interpretation of this dream. Another is that this is a metaphor for the Hulk persona forcibly taking control away from Bruce. Remember, Hulk is currently losing consciousness as he falls a very long way back to Earth. He risks reverting back into Bruce and dying on impact. Hulk takes control to ensure they live. This reading is bolstered by this line that comes later. You found me. You weren't that hard to find. Yes, I was. The Hulk persona forcibly takes control, and Bruce becomes lost within it. His consciousness is overpowered by his base aggression that continues to build and build, getting more and more control. The thing that worries me is a physical wound is finite, but with emotions, what's to say that it won't just go on and on and start a chain reaction? At this point, only Betty has influence enough to bring him back. And she does just that. Ross lets her go to Hulk, calming him so that he reverts back to Bruce. She cries, knowing that he will once more be taken by the military, likely to be killed. We cut to some time later. David has turned himself in, under the promise that he will have one more chance to see Bruce. Betty sees this as Bruce's last opportunity to confront his past. She tried and failed to get him to do so at his old home. Perhaps meeting his father in person will allow him to finally move on. She gets Ross to arrange this meeting, and he does so with the intention to kill Bruce at the first inkling of trouble. David is brought before Bruce. He recalls dreaming about his mother, lamenting that he doesn't even know her name. The audience does, though. Edith. David, what's going on? I think this moment would be more powerful had her name not already been revealed. It would allow the audience to further empathize with Bruce and see from his perspective. As Bruce cries, David tries to console him, but Bruce tells him to get fucked. This spurs on David to start ranting and raving about how he should get what he wants. David's motivations and goals are a little confusing. He desires immortality and a power that surpasses God. To improve on nature, my nature, knowledge of oneself, it's the only path to the truth that give men the power to go beyond God's boundaries and be reborn a hero of the kind that walked the earth long before the pale religions of civilization infected humanity's soul. He wants it so bad he's willing to experiment on himself. When his genetic alteration is passed on to Bruce, David concludes that Bruce is a monster that needs to be cured but it's not clear why. What made Bruce a monster? What about him needed to be cured? Bruce ended up living 30 years without this cure, and was physically fine until the accident. This is kind of important. Bruce's monstrous nature caused David to get kicked off the project, which led him to blow up the base, attempt to kill Bruce, accidentally kill his wife, and spend 30 years in prison. Everything, from Bruce's trauma to the Hulk's existence, is predicated on David thinking him a monster. It's a major flaw of the movie that cracks its very foundations. Anyway, after getting out 30 years later, David becomes a janitor at Bruce's lab. And he maybe killed someone to get the job? Hey, what happened to Benny? Benny's dead. I'm the new guy. One day, he collects one of Bruce's hairs to experiment on. I can only assume he's still trying to find a cure. I don't know what else he would be doing. But again, I'm not sure why a pre-Hulk Bruce would need a cure in the first place. Then the accident happens, and Bruce miraculously survives. This prompts David to make himself known. He now wants to study and replicate Bruce's genetic alteration. Now we will understand it. We will harness it. Bruce's transformation is sometimes associated with space, such as stars and nebulae. It's as if the movie is comparing the power of the Hulk to something larger and grander than human comprehension. This harkens back to David's desire to surpass God, and why his research at the start was accompanied by this same imagery. Something about Bruce surviving the accident convinces David that he's the key to the power he seeks. He's no longer a monster that needs to be cured or killed. So you want to know what's wrong with him? So you could fix him, cure him, change him. My son is unique. That's why you can't relate to him. But you thought he was a monster. David changed his mind because Bruce became someone with a power to be hardest. But without knowing why David saw him as a monster in the first place, it's difficult to understand why this made him change his mind. When Bruce hulks out for the first time, David sees the power he possesses and wants it for himself. Then David does something weird. He sticks his Hulk dogs on Betty to force Bruce to transform. I don't know to what end. Neither does Bruce. She wanted me to change into that mindless Hulk. Why would he want that? And this stunt gets Bruce captured by the military, which he clearly didn't want. You brought your father down upon his head. How little you understand, Miss Ross, and how dangerous your ignorance has become. 
Did he expect the dogs to kill Hulk? Did he want to get samples off his corpse? The movie emphasizes the importance of getting samples off Hulk while he's alive. Should I neutralize him? No! I can't do anything with goo! Come on! So I doubt that's what David wanted. He then replicates the accident on himself. I don't know if this was a last resort because he lost Bruce, or if this was always the plan. Maybe he originally wanted to study Bruce and develop a less risky means of replicating his power. Who knows? He gains absorbing powers. And he has a line later saying, I can partake all essence of things. So I started calling him partaking man. <laughs> That's a joke. He gains partaking powers, but it's unstable. It's not clear in what way. Is he dying? Or are the powers just not as strong as they could be? Either way, David's goals shift again. Now he wants to use his partaking ability to take Hulk's power, rather than study and replicate it. And that's what led him to requesting this meeting. He wants to either convince Bruce to give up his power willingly. So I need your strength. I gave you life. Now you must give it back to me. Only a million times more radiant, more powerful. Or rile him up and take it by force. This leads into David's views on Bruce, which are more consistently characterized. David is incapable of understanding other people. You know it's beyond your boundaries. Other people. All you've given Bruce is fear. Fear of life. It's why he was surprised when Bruce's mother took the knife for him. And it's why his interest in Bruce is entirely self-serving. He lacks empathy. He doesn't even understand the damage he's done to Bruce. You should blame yourself for what you've done to your son. And what have I done to my son, Miss Ross? Nothing. I tried to improve on the limits in myself. Myself, not him. This is why David views Hulk as his true son, his true legacy, not Bruce. I didn't come here to see you. I came here to see my son, my real son, the one inside of you. The Hulk was born of David experimenting on himself, as well as the trauma he inflicted on Bruce. Of course, you're my flesh and blood. But then you're something else too, aren't you? My physical son. But the child of my mind too. Hulk is the culmination of David's research. He represents the accomplishment of his aspirations. Hulk is the one that serves his goals, not Bruce. Now son, listen to me. I found a cure for me. You bitch. But David wasn't always a selfish bastard. At least not completely. Like for Bruce, his wife's death was traumatic for David as accidentally killing your wife would be. It severed his last ties to normalcy and compassion. There were instances where David was content to be a husband and a father, providing happy memories for Bruce. But after his wife's death, that all went away, and he became truly motivated by selfish gain. When the accident occurred, we were shown the gamma explosion, which represents the trauma that gave birth to the Hulk. When David recreates the accident, we see it again, though blurred and muffled. Like Hulk, David's power is inextricably linked to that traumatic event. It was as if she and the knife merged. Do you really believe that I am separate from you? My cells can transform to absorb enormous amounts of energy. Like Bruce, David refuses to confront that trauma. His incoherent ranting is a coping mechanism. He refuses to blame himself, hiding behind poetic language and metaphors. It was as if she and the knife merged. And in that one moment, I took everything that was dear to me and transformed it into nothing more than a memory. Instead, he lashes out at those around him, as if they were the ones that plunged the knife into her. Think of all those men out there in their uniforms, inflicting their petty rule over the entire globe. Think of all the harm they've done! To you! To me! To humanity! Bro, what are you talking about, man? David is a warning of what Bruce might become should he refuse to properly address his issues. So David's ranting and raving while Bruce is screaming his head off. At this point, you'd think Ross would intervene. In fact, why have they allowed David to walk around freely? Shouldn't he be strapped to a chair like Bruce? This strange decision has some serious consequences. David goes. I'll go! You just watch him go. You just watch me go! He bites into one of the wires. They try to electrocute him, but he partakes it and becomes a big ol' electric man. 
By sucking away all the power, Ross is helpless to stop Bruce from transforming. David then grabs Hulk and shoots into the sky. They fight among the clouds before landing near a lake. David becomes a rock man. Hulk chucks him into the lake and wades into the water after him. Now a water man, David drags Hulk under. Let's delve into the Hulk. What is he? He is the version of Bruce Banner that witnessed his mother's death, composed of those emotions and memories. As we look at each other, we know that 300 little recognizable body motions that mean something and apply them to the Hulk correctly so that you think the Hulk has got this kind of childlike personality. Hulk is that version of Bruce separated out and concentrated into its own persona. In a sense, he is Bruce. But would you really destroy part of yourself? I don't think so. The Gamma just unleashed what was already there. Unleashed what? Me. You know, so you can turn a little green for me again. And I can carve off a piece of the real you. I didn't come here to see you. I came here to see my son. My real son. The one inside of you. This is why Bruce describes hulking out like being born. He's letting out an aspect of himself that's been buried since early childhood. He does so because he's unable to prevent expressing those repressed feelings. It was like a dream. About what? Rage, power, and freedom. The rage of seeing his mother killed, the power he wishes he had to stop it, and the freedom to escape that terrible situation. Letting loose these bottled up feelings is a cathartic experience. You know what scares me the most? Is it when it happens, when it comes over me, and I totally lose control. I like it. The morning after his first two Hulk outs, Bruce appears noticeably more calm and relaxed. He's almost at peace, at least for a short time. It's the realization of Betty's fears. Earlier, she described a dream she had. Baby Betty is alone on the desert base. The gamma explosion occurs in the distance, and adult Bruce appears. He stares at Betty intensely before grabbing at her menacingly. The gamma bomb signifies Hulk's birth, which is why Bruce appears shortly after. And it's not four-year-old Bruce because Betty didn't meet him until he was already a man, and this is from her perspective. Bruce, or Hulk, then lashes out at Betty in anger. Basically, Betty fears that by repressing his emotions, they will inevitably burst out of him in a violent, dangerous manner that will harm friend and foe alike. He sends his dogs, didn't he? <laughs> and the way Bruce grabs at Betty parallels David grabbing at his mother. It ties back to the idea that Bruce, by not acknowledging his trauma, is emulating David as a means of coping with it. In Jungian terms, Hulk is Bruce's shadow. He represents those traits that Bruce has attempted to ignore. Thus far, he's avoided and fought against any attempts to acknowledge that side of him, causing his aggression to fester and grow. Refusing to acknowledge his shadow makes Bruce susceptible to being controlled by it and his destructive nature. Those are what the Hulk outs are, possession by his shadow self. The more Bruce refuses to incorporate the shadow, the more he's consumed by it. The thing that worries me is a physical wound is finite. But with emotions, what's to say that it won't just go on and on and start a chain reaction? Puny human. You found me. You weren't that hard to find. Yes, I was. This is why Betty adamantly wants Bruce to confront his trauma, his shadow, rather than bottle it up. She asks about his birth parents. She brings him to his old house, and she facilitates a meeting between him and his father, only by integrating his shadow. By acknowledging it and incorporating it, can he properly tame it and become a whole person? Carl Jung stressed that an individual's proper goal is wholeness, not perfection. The path to a greater character, to a more effectual approach to life, lies in integrating those elements of our psyche that for too long have been repressed and denied. The elements that make up what Jung called our unconscious shadow side. All of this builds up to this moment. Trapped underwater, David siphons away Hulk's power. Keep fighting. By fighting David, by lashing out in anger just as David did, he gives in to his repressed aggression and is further subsumed into Hulk. The camera then zooms into Hulk's eye, and we see the true Hulk, the tragic memories that compose that persona. Sleep now, Bruce, and forget forever. Struggle no more, and give me all of your power. David urges Bruce to repress that side of him, so Hulk will continue to lash out and destroy Bruce from the inside. You think you can live with it? Take it! Right now, he is Hulk, but we hear Bruce's voice as we swim through his childhood memories. For the first time, Bruce as Hulk is aware. It's as if previously, Bruce slept as Hulk took control. It was like a dream. 
but now he's awake. He's acknowledging Hulk. He's acknowledging the memories and emotions of that traumatic event. You think you can live with it? Bruce starts to incorporate the Hulk persona into his greater consciousness, and thus gains control over it. Which is why, for the first time not in a dream, Hulk speaks. Take it off! For the first time, Bruce is in charge. By confronting David, Bruce is able to integrate his shadow. He's able to express these emotions, not in an unchecked violent rampage, but in a directed manner towards David, the source of his trauma. And it overwhelms him. David, with his inability to understand or empathize with other people, is overpowered by the suffering he created. Again, it's like poetry, it's sort of if they rhyme. By defeating David, Bruce figuratively vanquishes his trauma. In the aftermath, he recalls a happy moment of him and his father. And unlike before, it's not tainted by the agony of a terrible memory. Counterintuitively, by letting himself remember those traumatic memories, he's no longer tormented by them. Now, this is all metaphorical, of course. What's literally happening in this sequence is kind of vague. David is partaking Hulk's power, but what power means in this context isn't clear. Is it gamma? If that were the case, couldn't he have just belted himself with more gamma rays? And isn't it a little contradictory for David to tell Bruce to both keep fighting and struggle no more? You could argue that he's telling Hulk to keep fighting and Bruce to stop struggling, but that's not clear. Then he dies because Hulk's power is too much for his body to handle, also because he gets nuked. Bruce is presumed dead, and Ross is solemn, disappointed that he yet again failed to help him. We cut to a year later. Ross gives Betty a call. They're a little awkward with one another, but on better terms. I'm glad I caught you. I'm glad you called. After his mistakes and failures with Bruce and Betty, he's trying to do better. He is the antithesis to David, who, until his death, refused to acknowledge the harm he caused Bruce. Ross asks if Betty would tell him if Bruce somehow survived and contacted her. No. I wouldn't. I'll tell you though, if you were alive, I'm the last person I would want him to come to because as much as I miss him, I loved him. I. Uh... Betty says she misses Bruce in the present tense, but that she loved him in the past tense. After everything that happened, she's choosing to move on, perhaps because she wouldn't want Bruce depending on her as an antidote to his condition. After all, she was doing her damnedest to get him to confront and overcome his issues. She would want him to get better and move on himself. We cut to South America, where a bearded Bruce is helping deliver medication to people in need. Some men with guns show up and confiscate it for the government. They accuse Bruce and the people of helping their enemies. This line finishes off Bruce's arc. It's the acceptance of his emotions. There's no longer the shaking of barely suppressed rage. There's the confident demeanor of a man who's tamed his aggression, and is prepared to use it in the defense of others. And that's where the movie ends. Wait, what is this? This music doesn't fit the movie's tone at all. On the topic of music, I love the soundtrack. I think Daniel Elf really captures this sense of foreboding and introspection that matches the movie's themes. I love writing music that's aggressive. I love taking out my aggression through the orchestra in my music when I can. It was very clear. Repressed, repressed, repression, breaking out, breaking out, and exploding. I don't know why we have a random rock song in the credits. As I mentioned at the start of the video, Hulk was a flop at the time of release. Let's look at some of the reasons that may have happened that I haven't already covered. Some find Eric Bana's portrayal of Bruce Banner too cold and distant, which is understandable. The point of the character is that Bruce isn't a whole person. Much of his strong emotions have been repressed and only get expressed as the Hulk, which is basically a separate character. He also doesn't have much agency. He spends much of the movie looking thoughtful and having nightmares. Oh no, I'm having a flashback. It can be hard for the audience to get invested in such a character. Also, his angry face is quite funny. Speaking of notable acting... Stop! What? Stop! What? Let's go. Think of a homo. Cinema. Cinema indeed. Nick Dolte's performance as David Banner goes hard. So hard I wouldn't be surprised if many found it over the top. I really think his performance at times are really funny, but it's not a laugh out loud kind of funny. The other actors are well cast for their roles and do a great job selling their characters. Some people say the movie is too long. I don't think That's the length in and of itself is the issue. It's the wonky pacing that makes the movie feel too long. 
For instance, you have a three-act story structure, but the second act is absurdly long compared to the first and third, making the middle of the movie feel sluggish and bloated. As you reach the third act, the story's momentum peters out, gets suddenly jump-started to squeeze out a little more action, then abruptly dies. At the time, audiences may have been misled regarding what to expect from this movie. Hulk is an in-depth psychological exploration of the effects of childhood trauma, portrayed via heavy use of symbolism and metaphor. It's a psychodrama art film. This was not evident in the trailers. I think the rage is triggering the transformations. Sounds a little far-fetched. I think we passed far-fetched a long time ago. I've never felt better. Hulk, ready PT-13. Got the urge for something awesome? Follow the Hulk to Burger King. So some of the negativity surrounding the movie might have been fueled by false expectations. Hulk was not the movie audiences were promised. However, avoiding deceitful marketing was not the lesson producer Kevin Feige learned. Five years later, for The Incredible Hulk, many of the contemplative, philosophical, and psychological scenes were axed. Kevin likely concluded it was all that heady stuff that caused Hulk to flop, and did his damnedest to remove anything like it from its reboot. We wanted to get to that, and we wanted to, frankly, have more fun and have more action this time around, uh, and really deliver the Hulk that we thought audiences wanted to see. We all know how that turned out. Personally, I think that's the best part of Hulk. It's a fascinating exploration of a character's psyche, communicated in a unique and interesting way. It goes to show the depth and potential of the character that's been severely lacking as of late. Damn, bruh! Hulk is one of those movies that gets better the more you think about it. Give it a rewatch. You might find it hasn't aged as poorly as you once thought. And if you're interested in more Hulk content, stick around. I've got a series on MCU Hulk and She-Hulk. And consider supporting me via Super Thanks and Patreon. Till next time. <laughs>